This is a long video, so I'll keep the intro short. It's the fourth part in my series on Obama and Russia. We've covered the collapse of the USSR and subsequent expansion of NATO, Obama's early attempts at more or less successful bilateral cooperation with Russia, and the faltering diplomatic scene in Syria. Now we're going to cover Ukraine, where tension really mounted between the US and Russia. I'll reiterate here that underlying all of this are the twin pillars of the conflict. Obama's desire to maintain the US-backed liberal order built since 1991, and Putin's desire to re-establish a world of great power rivalries with Russia as a geopolitical equal to the United States. A word of caution here. The political and military situation in Ukraine has been steadily developing since the end of 2013. In history, no source is objective, but this is doubly true for an episode whose proximate events have yet to end. Triply true when we consider who might benefit politically from the narrative bending in a certain direction. Whatever I have to say on the matter will not be the whole truth, it may be even less than half true. All I can do is cite my sources, ask for better ones from those who disagree with me, and plead that we stop treating world affairs like a marvel or... Star War. That kind of Manichaean outlook is sometimes appropriate, but in world affairs, where people fight and cooperate in a realm murked in gray, it's a perspective that makes only fools. So don't fall into that trap. Enjoy! Now, Mr. Spock. Part 1. A hobbled independence. Any analysis of Eastern Europe needs to orient itself within the context of the USSR's demise and collapse. In their final decade in power, the communists attempted economic reform, trying to retool an economic system that was too geared towards heavy industry and military production, leaving much consumer demand to be filled by an illicit or shadow economy. Soviet leaders attempted to introduce, among other things, limited marketization, some private property accumulation, and reduced censorship. This led, entirely by accident, to political upheaval rather than mere economic reform. The republics within the USSR ultimately did vote to secede, client states and the Warsaw Pact countries pushed back against their existing governments, and while violence was sporadic and generally subdued, the Soviet system did ultimately collapse with an astonishing lack of bloodshed. The first post-Soviet years in Ukraine moved from optimism to despair, as the economic and political institutions came to be dominated by the same people that had run the Soviet government, the Red Directors and members of the former nomenklatura, those who had the access and training to turn once public property into private fiefdoms. These were the men who dominated Ukrainian politics in the first decade or so after independence. The liberalized economy did allow some new blood on the scene, notably among those from the shadow economy, hitherto criminals, who successfully legalized their pre-existing economic power. Amid the rise of these domestic oligarchs came a surge in foreign investment, prompted by lax laws that favored foreign companies at the expense of the domestic population. Yet despite the foreign investment and the gains promised to the Ukrainian people by neoliberal ideologues and policymakers, the country's economy collapsed in the decade after independence. In 1990, the Ukrainian GDP was $81.46 billion, roughly a third that of Wisconsin. By 1999, GDP had fallen to 38% its Soviet size. By that time, some of the foreign-friendly regulations had been repealed, which was one reason that foreign investment into Ukraine slowed considerably into the new millennium. This left economic power firmly in the hands of domestic oligarchs, concentrated in the industrialized regions of the East, the Donbass. While much of Ukraine is relatively homogenous by Eastern European standards, a Russian-speaking minority is concentrated in the Eastern sector. This was the region that under Soviet rule received the most economic development, 
And even after the USSR's collapse, the Ukrainian East maintained very close economic ties to Russia. Most Western analysts thus presumed that Western Ukrainians, with fewer linguistic and ethnic and weak economic ties to Russia, favored cooperation with the West and were more eh, loyal to the Ukrainian nation than their Eastern counterparts, who were seen to be drawn closer to Russia's orbit. Economic collapse brought with it a simultaneous evisceration of the existing institutions of Ukrainian infrastructure and welfare, driving many into lives of desperation and crime. A turn of events that the U.S. would experience in the 70s and 80s as deindustrialization moved jobs overseas and pushed working-class people into poverty. The fear of physical harm is evident in many ways. For example, this store's bulletproof shield runs from counter to ceiling. It's not peculiar to Detroit. And this suburban housing area with its fortress-like walls is planned to provide security for its residents. A toll gate screens out strangers trying to enter. Those sectors of the economy that remained relatively vibrant, like heavy industry, concentrated in the East, were dependent not only on Russian commercial relations, but Russian energy as well. Thus, any disagreement with Putin carried with it the possibility of economic catastrophe for Ukraine's already shrunken economy. Europe also relied heavily on Russian energy, prompting the EU to propose in 2008 the Southern Corridor Pipeline as a way to bypass Russian energy sources. NATO's expansion into the former Warsaw Pact countries has already been discussed, as has Putin's 2008 response to the prospect of Georgia joining the alliance. He invaded them. But while Obama demurred on expanding NATO further when he took the presidency, Western efforts to integrate Ukraine did not cease. In May 2009, the EU created the Eastern Partnership Program for six post-Soviet states, including Ukraine. Participants were offered duty-free access to EU markets and visa-free travel. In return, signing countries agreed to abide by EU regulations. Association also carried the prospect of a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement, or DCFTA. Putin countered these overtures with the creation of a customs union and later the Eurasian Economic Union, or EEU which he saw as a counterweight to Western economic encroachment in the short run and a long-run rival to other economic blocs like the U.S., EU, or China. Members of the Obama administration also worked to undermine Russian dominance of European energy needs, especially in Eastern Europe. As Hillary Clinton relates, Teams of U.S. energy experts fanned out across Europe to help countries explore alternatives to Russian gas. When I visited Poland in July 2010, Foreign Minister Sikorsky and I announced Polish-American cooperation on a global shale gas initiative to capitalize on new extraction technologies in a safe, environmentally sustainable manner. The boom in U.S. fossil fuel production, which began under Bush II and flourished under Obama, had an impact on EU energy as well. Since the U.S. no longer needed to import as much foreign material, gas once destined for the U.S. started finding its way to Europe. This forced Russian firms like Gazprom to compete to a greater degree than hitherto, weakening their power over the energy supply. We can see, then, that in addition to diplomatic disagreements in places like Syria and military disagreements over missile defense, the U.S. and Russia were set for a new round of economic competition, as Western powers sought to circumnavigate Russian fossil fuels. Since Russia's economic recovery and resurgent military might depended on energy exports, this would certainly not sit well in the Kremlin. Part 2 Euromaidan. Ukraine's post-Soviet political history had seen its share of turmoil, notably the 2004 Orange Revolution 
and the hotly contested presidential election of 2010. These tumults came with controversial constitutional reforms, divisive leadership, and the usual change-based rhetoric that somehow never materialized into concrete action. Yet, the country had remained relatively free from the scourge of political violence. That changed in 2014. The regional party dominated Ukrainian politics at this time, commanding patchy support in the West, but overwhelming support in the East. This party was led by then-president Viktor Yanukovych, whose corrupt administration vacillated uneasily between the influence of both the US-EU and Russia. When pushed, he tended to side with Russia, in part because he certainly benefited from Russian campaign financing. John Kerry called him Putin's made guy. But to single him out for political corruption is somewhat lopsided and unfair. His opponents were not bereft of foreign influence or funding. Indeed, since 1991, billions of dollars from U.S. organizations had sought to guide Ukrainian politics. In addition to money, the majority of his support was also in the eastern Donbass region, which had stronger economic ties to Russia than to the West. As talks with the EU over a free trade agreement proceeded, President Yanukovych simultaneously considered the Eurasian Union trade agreement presented by Russia. Growing frustrated with his exclusion from these talks, Putin decided to try and force the Ukrainian president to choose his side by threatening to ban Ukrainian imports to Russia and to raise prices on gas. The pressure from the oligarchs of the eastern Donbass region, who would have felt Putin's price hikes most acutely, prompted Yanukovych to act, and he refused to sign the free trade agreement with Europe in late November 2013. Moderately sized demonstrations in support of the DCFTA had been simmering for some time. As Yanukovych evinced opposition to the treaty, these grew into the so-called Euromaidan protests, which espoused a broadly Western-focused outlook. The protests continued when Yanukovych refused to sign the treaty. But what really set the heart of protest ablaze was police violence. One night in November, as protests were winding down and the majority student demonstrators decided to make one last Protestant hurrah, the police came out in force, brutalizing and injuring several people. The public reaction was quick and fierce, with protesters flooding the streets of the capital, Kiev. The fundamental impetus of the demonstrations had now changed. No longer were the protesters in the Maidan Square for closer ties to the EU, but against the president and the omnipresent, long-seated lawlessness and corruption that his administration had perpetuated and exacerbated. Euromaidan had become simply Maidan. In December 2013, the police again tried to use force to clear the protesters in Kiev, but were unsuccessful. In light of this continued violence, EU leaders proclaimed solidarity with the protesters. U.S. Undersecretary of State Newland made a snap visit to the country, engaging with protesters and handing out cookies. This unwanted Western attention precluded further government action against the protesters, at least for the time being. As violence between protesters and police escalated in January 2014, Yanukovych signed a series of laws restricting the right to protest, and hundreds of thousands took to the streets of Kiev in response. Protests spread to the Justice Ministry, and by the end of the month, Parliament had repealed the anti-protest measures. Seeing the situation deteriorating before their eyes, members of Yanukovych's government began resigning. February saw unsuccessful attempts at thawing tensions, and by the middle of the month, street battles were injuring hundreds and killing dozens. Snipers were killing protesters on the streets, Parliament responded to the violence by restoring the 2004 Constitution, thus reducing the power of the presidency. It also granted amnesty to the protesters. Yanukovych soon fled the capital, and an interim government was declared on February 24th, which issued a warrant for the arrest of the former president. On February 28th, 
Yanukovych gave a speech from Russia declaring himself the rightful president of Ukraine. This opened the door for Russian intervention into the quote-unquote chaos of Ukrainian politics. The president's swift exit from Ukraine has been variously categorized as a revolution, a western-backed coup, a fascist takeover, a man fleeing for his life. It's certainly true that the West wanted Yanukovych gone, and far-right elements were a vocal minority among the protesters and interim government. Although when elections were held in late 2014, none of the far-right parties gained the necessary minimum of 5% of votes required to sit in the Ukrainian parliament. With due consideration for the outside influences on the political fortunes of the country, we would do well to remember a few domestic facts. The corruption of the Yanukovych government was real. His abuse of power was real. And the ire of the Ukrainian people was real. Whatever direction the U.S. or Russia tried to push events, Ukrainians themselves had opinions too, and at least a degree of agency. Unfortunately, the protests themselves were not an ideological, but rather a reactionary event, pushing against Yanukovych rather than towards a common goal. This left room for many of the old elites to squirm their way out of facing responsibility for their role in things. Thus, the political leaders changed to one degree or another, but the economic realities remained fundamentally neoliberal. And where the economy stays the same, so too the political institutions. Part 3. Russia Reacts From the Russian standpoint, we should recall that events in Ukraine unfolded within the context of the expansion of NATO, disagreements with the Obama administration regarding missile defense, and the Winter Olympics in Sochi. The most expensive Olympic event in history, Putin took on the project as a symbol not only of Russia's renewed prestige, but of his own role in that success story. The toppling of a leader friendly to Russia damaged the idea of Russia as a great power worthy of respect. Russia responded to the chaos in Kiev with military action. On February 27th, Russian special forces entered Crimea, intent on shoring up Russian control of that peninsula, and thus ensuring continued access to the Russian naval base at Sevastopol, which Russia had been leasing from Ukraine. This was the home of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, and many a legendary Russian battle. This set in motion a series of political events that culminated in the annexation, or incorporation, of Crimea into the Russian Federation by the end of March. Putin gave a speech, contemporaneously, laying out his version of events. He characterized what happened in Crimea as a democratic transition away from a Soviet-imposed historical anomaly, Ukrainian control of Crimea, and back towards what was natural and popularly demanded, incorporation of the peninsula into Russia. Pay close attention to Putin's historical narrative, especially his view of how things went for Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union. Remember, for Putin, the Soviet Union and Russia are two distinct things, despite what some ignorant commentators in the West seem to think. To understand why this choice was made, you need to take a glimpse into the history of Crimea. You need to understand the value of Russia to Crimea and the importance of Crimea to Russia. Everything is uh, related to Russian history. Colleagues, Crimea has always been an integral part of Russia in the hearts and minds of people. That faith has been preserved and passed on from generation to generation.
the Soviet Union has collapsed. The events unfolded in such a fast way that none of the nations realized the dramatic nature of the event. Many people in Ukraine and Russia and other former Soviet republics believe that the new Commonwealth of Independent States would become a new statehood because they were promised one single currency, a common economic space, a one single armed forces, but that remained just on paper. We didn't see a new big country emerging. And when Crimea ended up in a different stage, Russia realized that it was not just robbed, it was robbed in broad daylight. And we have to admit that Russia itself contributed to that process by asking everyone to take as many sovereignty as possible. Many activists and citizens raised that issue. Many said that Crimea is a Russian land and Sevastopol is a Russian city. We all realized that, we felt that in our hearts, but we had to live with the realities. And we had to build on that to work with Ukraine, with our fraternal nation. These relations have always been and will always be the most important one, and I'm not exaggerating. We need good relations with Ukraine. That was the most important thing. And they shouldn't be held hostage to some territorial issues. But we believe that Ukraine would serve as a good neighbor, that uh, Russian-speaking people would live in a democratic, civilized, friendly state, that their legal rights would be ensured according to the norms of international law. These were our hopes, but the situation unfolded in a completely different way. We've seen attempts to ban the Russian language and to assimilate the Russian population. And of course, Russians just like other minorities suffered from constant political crisis that's Ukraine been going through for 20 years. I realize why people in Ukraine wanted change. Sympathize with those who were on Maidan with peaceful slogans. They spoke against uh, misery and poverty. Those who were behind the latest events in Ukraine had other goals in mind. They wanted to stage a coup, another coup. They wanted to seize power regardless of anything. They've used terror, violence and murders and pogroms. Who executed that? It's neo-Nazis, nationalists and anti-Semites. We wanted to have a genuine dialogue with the West. We always offer cooperation on a variety of issues. We want to build confidence. We want to work on an equitable basis. We want to have honest relations. But we didn't see any reciprocity. We were cheated. We were deceived. Some decisions were taken behind our back. And uh, the same was with NATO's expansion to the East. The same was with deployment of the military infrastructure near borders. They were, we were given the same mantra. They said, well, it's none of your business. But, well, you could say that easily, of course. But we couldn't swallow that. That was the same with the deployment of the missile defense. That's still going on despite our, fear, our fears. Uh, that was the same with the procrastination on the visa agreements. And the, now we are threatened with sanctions. But we are living in a world of limits that have been imposed on us. So that is why we believe that the 
policy of uh, determined that took place uh, in the 18th, 19th and the 20th century is still there. We are always being cornered. And that's simply because we have an independent position that we are defending it, that we call a spade a spade, that we don't we are not hypocritical, but everything has its limits. And in the case of Ukraine, our Western partners have crossed a line, a red line. They've been unprofessional. They've been irresponsible. Let's repeat Putin's argument in brief, since many Westerners spend so little time doing so and grappling with these ideas. Like any conservative, his narrative starts in an arbitrary and idyllic past. In this case, with the idea that Crimea has always been integral to Russia, an entity that is left vague and undefined. The Bolsheviks, for their own political reasons, gave Ukraine control over Crimea. In the chaos of Soviet collapse, this injustice was allowed to continue. In this way, and so many others, Russia was robbed. Despite universal feeling that Sevastopol and Crimea were Russian, the new federation tried to work with Ukraine as a brother nation. But Ukraine shirked its duty as a good, civilized neighbor when it failed to protect ethnic Russians within its borders. Maidan protesters had admirable goals, but were co-opted by neo-Nazis, nationalists, and anti-Semites, who cooed the Ukrainian government, thus threatening ethnic Russians even more. On the other hand, honest and equitable relations with the West were done in by cheating and military expansionism. Russia can no longer allow these centuries-old limitations, can no longer swallow these embarrassments, the kinds of things that have always pushed Russia into a corner. During this time, the price Russia charged Ukraine for natural gas skyrocketed some 80%, which threatened to cripple the economy of a country already undergoing political upheaval. By April, Russia had perhaps 40,000 troops in a state of high readiness amassed alongside its border with Ukraine, ostensibly ready to protect ethnic Russians living in Ukraine that might fall prey to violence amid the country's deteriorating political situation. In Donetsk, Luhansk, and several other eastern cities, anti-government, or pro-Russia militias, seized government buildings and erected checkpoints. Observers noted that some of these soldiers were wearing Russian-issue equipment and lacked any identifying insignia. They acted with military precision. This prompted suspicion that these were not legitimate Ukrainian actors, local boys, but were rather Russian special forces or at least Russian-trained agents. The Ukrainian interim government demanded that the soldiers surrender, but when they refused, the government asked the UN to send in peacekeepers. Combat escalated through April. Separatist militias made increasing use of Russian equipment in their fight against a disorganized Ukrainian military reliant upon volunteer battalions and local militias. Trying to placate the demands voiced by separatist groups, the central government agreed to hold referenda in the eastern cities so they could vote on whether those areas should be granted more autonomy. When held, these referenda were accused by many to be fraudulent. In any event, they did nothing to defuse the situation. At the end of May, a new Ukrainian president, the billionaire Poroshenko, took office in the wake of an unprecedented electoral landslide. He urged peace in the east and also in order to placate the Maidan protesters, promised fundamental reform of Ukraine's political institutions. Much of this, however, ultimately took a back seat to the war effort. By the end of June, Poroshenko signed the association agreement with the EU. That summer, pro-government forces also achieved several victories. Separatists tried to salvage their weakening situation by deploying increasingly sophisticated weaponry, including surface-to-air missiles, SAMs, and several Ukrainian planes were shot down, possibly by Russian forces inside Ukraine. On July 17th, Malaysia Airlines Flight 777 was shot down over Donetsk, probably by a Russian-issued SAM. This caused international outcry 
and threatened to escalate the war beyond the region. In late August, after a summer of success, pro-government forces experienced several setbacks, which the Ukrainian government blamed on the direct intervention of large numbers of Russian soldiers. NATO bolstered this claim, estimating more than 1,000 Russian soldiers had entered Ukraine. The equipment and troops Russia provided to their allies and surrogates in Ukraine did much to hamper the government's war effort. Nevertheless, it could not shift the initiative in favor of the separatists. By year's end, the battle lines had stalemated, with only about 7% of Ukrainian territory under separatist control. Part 4. The Initial U.S. Response As the conflict unfolded on the nightly news, high-profile U.S. politicians and intellectuals began beating the war drums, comparing Putin to Hitler and de-escalation, by implication, to Munich-level appeasement. He compared his actions to those of Adolf Hitler before World War II. Isn't this an exaggeration on your part? It is, it is obviously an exaggeration in view of what followed, but if you look at the events specifically that I had in mind, namely what he has done in Crimea and what Hitler did, for example, in Austria, the famous Anschluss, in which nobody was killed, but the whole country was incorporated into Germany, there are some striking similarities. The point is to make sure that they don't become more and more dangerous to the international community. What I said yesterday um, is that the claims by President Putin and other Russians uh, that they had to go into Crimea um, and maybe further into eastern Ukraine uh, because they had to protect the Russian uh, minorities. And that is reminiscent of claims that were made back in the 1930s when uh, Germany under uh, the Nazis uh, kept talking about how they had to protect German minorities in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, and elsewhere throughout Europe. So I just want everybody to have a little historic perspective. I'm not making a comparison, certainly, but I am uh, recommending that we perhaps can learn from uh, this tactic that has been used before. If he thinks that an ex a reasonable excuse is to protect the Russian citizens. What about Latvia? What about Estonia? What about Lithuania? What about Poland? What about Romania? These are countries all have Russian-speaking individuals. And by the way, you and I are old enough to remember that was the reason why Hitler went into the Sudetenland mm -hmm. to protect German citizens. It, it can't. It's it's a it's it's a, a a position that if it's allowed to stand will be a violation of everything we've stood for in the way of territorial integrity and sovereign nations. Amid these fiery historical analogs, the Obama administration acted. On March 4th, Secretary of State John Kerry visited Kiev. It is not appropriate to invade a country and at the end of a barrel of a gun, dictate what you are trying to achieve. That is not 21st century G8 major nation behavior. Whoa, hold on there a sec. We are at war once again, and this first phase is to take out Gaddafi's air defenses. Throughout the night, the U.S. pounded Libya. The strikes began with more than 110 Tomahawk missiles launched mostly from U.S. ships and submarines aiming at more than 20 targets, including surface-to-air missile sites. And this morning, reports that the U.S. took out a major Libyan airfield using B-2 bombers flown from a base in the U.S. The ship-launched missiles were fired from some 500 miles away. In the and what we are looking for here is a responsible way to meet the needs of the parties but respect the integrity, the sovereignty, the territorial integrity of he announced an initial $16.4 million to help Ukrainians at a moment of difficult transition, as he put it. Additional details soon emerged. A $1 billion loan guarantee, technical assistance for Ukraine's finance and election infrastructure, help in recovering assets said to be stolen by the Yanukovych administration, and economic sanctions against some Russian elites. <laughs> 
On March 17th, these scalpel sanctions took effect, causing some disruption to the Russian economy. $70 billion in capital fled the Russian financial system in the first quarter of 2014, more than all the previous year. Growth estimates were revised downward. Russia's central bank had to use billions of dollars to defend Russia's currency, deleting their cash reserves. Other than aid and sanctions, Obama was not willing to thrust himself too deeply into the situation. Quote, We are not going to be getting into a military excursion in Ukraine, he told NBC in March 2014. What we are going to do is mobilize all of our diplomatic resources to make sure that we've got a strong international correlation that sends a clear message. On the diplomatic front, the Obama team preferred to let the Germans, French, Ukrainians, and Russians take the lead. This, argued officials like Kerry, although one suspects he did not agree with this line of reasoning at the time, put responsibility on Europe to stay united on Ukraine, while hopefully deflating Putin's fears that this was turning into a U.S.-Russia proxy fight. Mutual disagreement initially hampered negotiations, but by mid-April, the U.S., Russia, Ukraine, and the EU signed the Geneva Accords. Signatories agreed to end the violence, disarm illegal groups, and provide amnesty for protesters. Also in April, Vice President Biden visited Kiev, promising $50 million in aid. He also threatened heavier sanctions against Russia if they failed to uphold their end of the recently signed accords. Fighting in the east of Ukraine, however, grew ever more violent, and Geneva broke down amid what seemed to be turning into civil war. Sanctions had some effect. But how quickly would economics ripple their way onto the battlefield? Diplomacy foundered. That left the military option. Ever since the annexation of Crimea in March 2014, several major Obama administration officials had been advocating military aid to Ukraine. These advocates included Secretary of State John Kerry, Undersecretary Victoria Nuland, who had handed out cookies during the Maidan protests, Defense Secretary Ash Carter, and General Philip Bridlove, the Supreme Allied Commander for NATO. While Obama did agree to begin issuing more material aid to Ukraine, he did so slowly, ever wary of escalating a conflict that involved the world's other major nuclear power. U.S. aid increased with $33 million worth of bomb disposal equipment, radios, and engineering equipment. Intelligence sharing also occurred at this time, although it did not include up-to-date targeting information. Amid bipartisan calls in Congress to do more by supplying weapons, ammunition, military vehicles, and training, the Obama team debated whether or not to send direct military aid, including more intelligence. This discussion continued through the summer of 2014. In September, Another round of diplomacy came to fruition with the Minsk Agreement. This ceasefire did slow the violence, but its efficacy was hampered by the Russians, who claimed that they were not involved in the conflict and therefore had no need to sign the agreement. Without their cooperation, the violence could not end. The ceasefire was completely broken by early 2015, and violence resumed previous levels. That same month, Obama gave a speech in one of the smallest members of NATO, Estonia. He lauded the Baltic states for not just winning their freedom, but laboring to create vibrant and democratic countries that took both their freedom and their security seriously. He condemned Russia's actions in Ukraine, but kept his focus on what NATO could do to bolster its own security, and in so doing, enhance the security of Europe more generally. But the people of the Baltic nations also knew that freedom needs a foundation of security. So you reached out to join the NATO alliance. And we were proud to welcome you as new allies, so that those words of your constitution, your timeless independence, will always be guaranteed by the strongest military alliance the world has ever known. 
And yet, as we gather here today, we know that this vision is threatened by Russia's aggression against Ukraine. It is a brazen assault on the territorial integrity of Ukraine, a sovereign and independent European nation. It challenges that most basic of principles of our international system, that borders cannot be redrawn at the barrel of a gun, that nations have the right to determine their own future. It undermines an international order where the rights of peoples and nations are upheld and can't simply be taken away by brute force. This is what's at stake in Ukraine. This is why we stand with the people of Ukraine today. We reject any talk of spheres of influence today. And just as we never accepted the occupation and illegal annexation of the Baltic nations, we will not accept Russia's occupation and illegal annexation of Crimea or any part of Ukraine. As free peoples, as an alliance, we will stand firm and united to meet the test of this moment. And here's how. First, we will defend our NATO allies, and that means every ally. Second, and in addition to the measures we've already taken, the United States is working to bolster the security of our NATO allies and further increase America's military presence in Europe. Third, NATO forces need the ability to deploy even faster in times of crisis. Fourth, even as we keep our country strong at home, we need to keep our alliance strong for the future. And that means investing in the capabilities like intelligence and surveillance and reconnaissance and missile defense. And here in Europe, nations need to do more to spur the growth and prosperity that sustains our alliance. Fifth, we must continue to stand united against Russia's aggression in Ukraine. And this brings me to the final area where our nations have to come together in our steadfast support for those who reach for their freedom. And yes, that includes the people of Ukraine. And few understand this better than the Baltic peoples. You know from bitter experience that we can never take our security and liberties for granted. Emphasizing the importance of Article 5 in the context of what could plausibly be characterized as a Russian invasion of Ukraine, clearly imply that the U.S. would not intervene directly in that confrontation. The thin red line. In this case, extended only as far as NATO's borders. In February, the leaders of Ukraine, Russia, France, and Germany agreed on a 12-point peace plan called Minsk II that proposed, among other things, the cessation of fighting, withdrawal of heavy weapons, release of prisoners, and the removal of all foreign troops from Ukrainian territory. A kind of peace, tenuous and incomplete as it was, managed to take hold. By the fall, both sides had pulled back their heavy weapons. Fighting continued, but at much lower levels. Amid this strategic stalemate, Obama and the U.S. Congress steadily increased the aid going to Ukraine. By March 2015, the U.S. had committed more than $120 million worth of equipment to Ukraine and had pledged an additional $75 million, including UAVs, counter-mortar radars, night vision devices, medical supplies, and more than 200 armored Humvees. This flow of material and munitions would escalate across three presidents, and by the end of 2021, some $2.5 billion in support had been provided. Part 5. A More Belligerent Posture Wanting to avoid an escalated military confrontation in Ukraine didn't mean that Obama wasn't going to act at all. Indeed, from 2014 onwards, the Obama administration adopted a much more muscular posture towards Russia. This began in the fall of 2014, 
when NATO established the Very High Readiness Joint Task Force, a unit designed to be able to deploy on 48 hours' notice from multiple locations in Europe to any crisis on NATO territory. Here's some footage from an official NATO propaganda video. Bonus points if you can discern which parts are from that video and which parts have been spliced in from Hollywood blockbusters. This sense of high readiness was evinced in U.S. policy as well. First, through the decisions of Obama's final Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, and second, through Obama's latter-day missile defense posture. Subsection 1. Ash Carter In his memoirs, the Defense Secretary catalogs the threatening actions Russia committed in the present and near past. His rendition may not be wholly accurate, but it gives voice to how a foreign policy liberal, committed to a world governed by U.S.-led institutions rather than a balance of great powers, saw the Russian threat. As he put it, quote, In Europe, Russia is behaving in a manner reminiscent of 19th century great power rivalries, rather than one befitting a responsible member of the modern international community. Of course, What an adjective like responsible means in this context is up for debate. He cites a litany of Russian misdeeds, using political, economic, and military power to undermine the sovereignty of its neighbors, Georgia and Ukraine in this case, intimidating other countries like Sweden, Finland, and the Baltic states, violating international agreements like the UN Charter, using disinformation to undermine institutions like NATO and the EU, interfering in U.S. and European election processes to further its own aims and objectives. Within Russia itself, Carter also notes that Putin's government had been, quote, aggressively modernizing its war-fighting doctrine and its military capabilities, using these reinvigorated capabilities to undo the liberal order built up after 1991. With an eye on flexing on others, Russia carried out major military exercises on its borderlands, snap or no-notice exercises that sowed fear and uncertainty among foreign onlookers. Russia also, according to Carter, violated the airspace of neighboring countries, and intercepted U.S. and NATO ships and aircraft operating in international waters and airspace. Finally, Carter notes developments in the area of nuclear arms, where Russia had allocated funds to retool and modernize its arsenal of apocalypse. More alarming still, Russian leaders had begun asserting that they considered nuclear arms as legitimate options to deter or prevent the United States from coming to the aid of its European allies. They also reneged on their commitments to several treaties related to nuclear weapons. Now, while some within the Obama administration remained unconvinced that Russia constituted, as Carter put it, an existential threat to the United States, by this point, circa 2015, Obama had come around to seeing Russia as more of a threat than back in 2012. At that time, during the presidential election, Obama had derided his opponent Mitt Romney for characterizing Russia as a high-tier threat. I want you to listen to that, and we'll talk on the other side. When you were asked what's the biggest geopolitical threat facing America, you said Russia. Not al-Qaeda. You said Russia. In the 1980s are now calling to ask for their foreign policy back because the Cold War has been over for 20 years. Now... Obama supported Carter's initiatives within the Department of Defense to retool U.S. policy in the face of Russian aggressiveness. These changes included both immediate and long-term projects. In the short term, 
the U.S. augmented its permanently stationed or continually deployed forces in Europe with additional Army Brigade combat teams, tanks, artillery, armored personnel carriers, and tactical aircraft. In the long term, policymakers initiated technology-focused endeavors designed to quicken any U.S. response to Russian aggression, ranging from the deployment of new unmanned systems and enhanced ground-based air and missile defenses to further research into new weapons platforms, like long-range anti-ship weapons, a new long-range strike bomber, electromagnetic rail guns, lasers, even a push into the realm of cyber warfare. Keep this last one in mind when we discuss Russian hacking in the 2016 U.S. election. Rounding out these new developments and technological advances, Carter reinstituted the kind of Russia-focused military planning among NATO countries not seen since the Cold War era. This included formal war planning and a new playbook that accounted for recent developments in Russian military doctrine, like hybrid warfare and the use of disinformation, as well as the realities of defending NATO's expanded borders. Through it all, says Carter, the president supported all the increases in spending and deployment I called for. Subsection 2. Missile Defense Revisited The July 2016 NATO summit at Warsaw witnessed the official declaration of an initial operational capacity of NATO's ballistic missile defense system. This meant that Elements included in the first two phases of Obama's EPAA, ship-based weapons and a deployment to Poland, were able to work together under NATO command and NATO control. Coupled with the renewed coordination among NATO members against Russia, the fact that NATO now controlled these anti-missile installations gave these systems an anti-Russia focus that had not been admitted to back in 2009. Remember, when Obama came into office, he said that these missile defense systems were against rogue states like Iran or North Korea, and insisted to the Russians that these missile defenses would not be used against Russia. Obama thus solidified the missile defense posture pioneered under George W. Bush, a full-throated departure from the Cold War view of missile defense as strictly a foreign policy liability. Back then, it was seen that these missile defense systems would invite the creation of ever more deadly offensive weapons, a spiraling arms race that would lead only to apocalypse. Now, missile defenses were established firmly among U.S. policymakers as legitimate deterrence to enemies and reassurances to allies. From the Russian perspective, the strategic nuclear parity that they had maintained with the West now seemed fundamentally in jeopardy. Concerned when W. Bush abrogated the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty in 2002, suspicious when Obama continued to support missile defense in 2009, shut out of a purportedly anti-Iran defense system, and now confronting a NATO with access to U.S. anti-ballistic missile defenses, Russia reacted by pouring ever greater sums of money into modernizing its nuclear arsenal. We saw earlier how Defense Secretary Carter characterized this nuclear modernization as a sign of Russian aggression, but clearly it's at least a little more complicated than that. The Russians clearly saw this as a defensive measure. The tail end of the Obama presidency, therefore, stood in stark contrast to its beginning. While New START had succeeded in drastically reducing the number of nuclear arms within both countries, the persistent and deepening tensions between Washington and Moscow, especially in the realm of U.S. efforts at missile defense, had prompted Russia to react. The U.S., in turn, would cite Russian modernization efforts as cause for its own multi-billion dollar countermeasures. Look out, Russia. The Air Force is getting ready for its new nuclear weapons. A new nuclear arms race had begun. <laughs>
Beginning in the mid-2000s, Russian leaders initiated several programs to modernize Russia's land-based ICBM arsenal, with funding currently focused on the completion of the RS-28 Sarmat as the new mainstay delivery system of the Russian nuclear arsenal. For the Navy, Russia is building five more Bore-class submarines, joining the three already in service. And they may order more still. In 2018, after years of trial and error, the new missile system for these submarines, the Bulava, was accepted for service. For the Air Force, Russian developers are also working on a new long-ranged bomber, the Pakta, which they hope will be subsonic but stealth-capable. Under Obama's tenure, the United States invested much energy into nuclear modernization. It transformed its main hydrogen bomb, the B-61, into a guided smart weapon, made its submarine-launched nuclear missiles five times more accurate, and gave its land-based long-range missiles so many added features that the Air Force in 2012 described them as basically new. To deliver these more lethal weapons, military contractors are currently building new heavy bombers, with Northrop Grumman contracted to build up to 100. The Navy is getting a dozen Columbia-class submarines to replace its decade-old fleet. Expenditures for these projects were overwhelmingly approved by an apparently intractable Congress, and continued at a hastened pace under the Trump administration, whose Department of Defense recommended a vast modernization and overhaul of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. In 2020, Northrop Grumman received a contract to build a new ICBM. The potential costs for nuclear modernization, if implemented to the fullest extent recommended by advocates, could top $1.5 trillion. These developments should outrage any sane person. And not just because of the annoying number of acronyms or because we could be spending that money to feed, house, care for, and educate people instead of incinerating them. Historically, the United States has pursued a strike-first nuclear policy, meaning that, if provoked by some nebulous action, the U.S. would use its nuclear weapons to defend its homeland, its allies, or its vital interests. Although planners generally hoped that the use of nuclear weapons could remain limited to a particular country, region, or continent, they admitted that this policy could trigger an all-out nuclear war. Even in this catastrophic scenario, many planners, thinkers, leaders, and generals still held out hope for victory, even if that victory meant the existence of one living American to zero living Russians. This outlook did not end with the Cold War. In 2010, Obama reaffirmed NATO as a nuclear alliance, meaning that nuclear weapons were part of its defense infrastructure. Packed within that nebulous phrase is the legacy of the nuclear first strike. Unsurprisingly, the election of Trump did not prompt any change in this existing policy. And despite what his rhetoric indicates, Trump didn't change anything that actually matters. In the year of our Lord 2017, the U.S. Department of Defense under Trump loudly reminded the world of this apocalyptic continuity when it reaffirmed that the United States would use nuclear weapons to defend its vital interests, quote-unquote, as if nuclear war were something to be understood in the language of Clausewitz or Bismarck, in the, in the realm of realpolitik. As already mentioned, Putin's government, in its departure from the Soviet Union, I might add, had already shifted in this direction as well, using language similar to the United States when discussing the use of nuclear arms. Humanity has enough on its plate just trying to deal with, I don't know, climate change, a problem made more obdurant by its scientific complexity, the fact that the human activity causing it is integral to the world's most powerful economies, and the reality that those who control economic and therefore much political power in the developed world are not keen on relinquishing that power, on changing the system that has benefited them so much, even at the cost of environmental catastrophe. 
do we really need another apocalypse? This one frustratingly simple to avoid? The politically correct may cancel me for this opinion, but I say no. Definitely no. Positively no. Decidedly no. Uh-uh. If you've managed to make it through the whole video, I do appreciate it. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this uh, was somewhat informative, interesting, give you some food for thought, future resources to check out, that kind of thing. Again, if you disagree with any part of this video, it's totally fine. Just ask that you put sources in your comments so that I can actually learn something, because obviously I don't know everything. Um, if you want to know more about some of the American analogs to the neoliberal policies pursued in Ukraine, obviously you can check out my book, He Was Our Man in Washington, A History of the Obama Years. It goes over a lot of other things that Obama did during his time in office. The next and final video in this installment will be on Obama's reaction to Russia's interference in the 2016 presidential election cycle. So I hope you'll tune in then.